Thank you, Seth. Um, good morning and Merry Christmas to all of you. Uh, I've got two verses here that are excellent verses for Christmas. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, and then Hebrews 2, verse 17 that uh, Seth just read. I picked one. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, and so follow with me as I read. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to be with your people. We say that every week, and every week it's true. It's a privilege to be with those that know you, who have been redeemed, who understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he's done for them and have laid hold of him through faith and are new creatures in Christ. That is a great blessing. And it's all because he came into this world. It's all because he became one of us in order to offer himself up as a sacrifice for us. And that's really the meaning of Christmas. And we celebrate it this day of the year every year, but it's something we should celebrate and reflect upon every day of the year, as we should the resurrection, the great event of Easter. These things are true every moment of the day, and we live in light of them and because of them. But it is a great time to be able to come on a Sunday morning and celebrate this day and reflect on what you have done by your grace and what he has done for us on the cross. And so we pray you bless that, Father, as we do that and enlighten us, uh, recall, help us to recall the great truths that we know, but sometimes we neglect. And so, for, Father, build us up in the faith, encourage us, may the Spirit of God teach us. We pray for our material needs as well as our spiritual needs, Lord. We have uh, many needs. We are thankful to see Lee back with us. We pray you continue to give him healing and encouragement. Pray for Carol Webb. and pray that you would bless her as she continues through a very difficult time of uh, recovery, healing. Pray that you would strengthen her, give her perseverance, and we pray that you would, would bring about a good and healthy result and bring her back with Wilford to our fellowship. We pray for Bob and Nancy Kaysen and pray you would bless them as they are going through very difficult times physically and pray for Margaret Smith the same. We pray that you'd strengthen her and bless her and then we think of Curtis and Beverly Randolph and pray that you would continue to give them healing. And Lord, there are others, I'm sure, that uh, need our prayers. You know them, and even when we aren't able to pray for them because we're not aware of their circumstances, you are, and you're taking care of them, and we are grateful for a God who knows all things and does all things well. And, of course, the greatest thing that we can think of is what we're about to celebrate this morning. And so we pray you'd bless us as we sing our hymns and bless us as we consider the scripture that we will be studying this morning and that you would bless us as we continue our service with the Lord's Supper and as we worship him. So bless us now, Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Since it's Christmas morning when we celebrate the Lord's birth, I have uh, titled my sermon, Imitating the Incarnation. I like that title. I'm not proud of it because I borrowed it from Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield. He wrote an article by that title, 
which is an exposition of our text, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, in which Paul encouraged the saints in Philippi to imitate Christ. In verse 5 he wrote, Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he explained the Lord's attitude. Paul did it in three simple verses. Verses 6, 7, and 8. And it's really remarkable. Warfield wrote, In a few quick and lively phrases... Paul explained what may be what we may call the whole doctrine of the person of Christ. The whole doctrine in three verses. And in one of the most theological passages in all of the Bible. It's probably true that more ink has been spilled over this text and especially over verse 7 than any text or verse in the Bible. What is also remarkable about this is Paul didn't write this as a theological discourse to explore the mystery of Christ's incarnation, of God becoming man and taking on flesh. He wrote it for the very practical purpose of helping, of encouraging the Philippians to adopt a certain attitude, one that would solve most, if not all, of the problems that plague us in our human relationships. One of the themes of the book of Philippians is joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. But there were problems in the church that become clear later in chapter 4. Instead of joy, there was jealousy, rivalry, discord. People were fighting and dividing. So to settle that dispute, to bring peace to conflict and prevent such disharmony among the saints in the future, Paul gave the solution. It's putting others first. It's self-sacrifice. Do nothing from selfishness, he wrote. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. But that's hard to do. It's very difficult for us to put others ahead of ourselves, put others first. So to give leverage to his advice, Paul gave the example of Christ and how he did that for us to save us. It's hard to do, it's hard to be selfless, but it is the path to harmony and happiness, to joy. And since this is the season in which we sing joy to the world, no passage in the Bible better explains the meaning of Christmas than this one. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Paul begins with the answer to rivalry and conflict. It's not self-motivation. It's, it's not self-reproach or even recalling our responsibilities and, and urging ourselves as Christians to, to do better and to be better. Now, we do need to remind ourselves of our Christian duties, and there is a place for self-correction, but ultimately the answer isn't in looking at ourselves. It is in looking at Christ. When we reflect on Him and we understand what He did for us, we will be motivated to imitate Him. That's the purpose of the example Paul gives. And isn't it interesting that the means that Paul used to incentivize humility and service, correct conduct, is a highly theological passage. But it shows that theology, correctly understood, is practical. So in verse 5, the apostle exhorts the Philippians to have a new attitude. To have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then in verse 6, Paul begins what Warfield called the whole doctrine of the person of Christ in order to explain that attitude and give the example that we are to follow, that of Christ, 
who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now that raises the question, what is the form of God? God is spirit. We know that because Jesus told that to the woman at the well in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, verse 24. How could a spirit have a form? And very simply, God does not have a physical form or structure. What this means is Christ, the Son of God, has the essential nature of the Father. The form of something shows what it is. It distinguishes it from something else. What we, we know, for example, that a tree is not a flower, or a flower not a tree, or we know that a mountain, what a mountain is from a valley, the difference between them by their shape. The form reveals what a thing is. And so when Paul wrote of the, the form of God, he meant what God is essentially. Jesus is that. In other words, Jesus had the same divine nature. And to avoid confusion, that's how the New International Version translates it. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or something to grasp. In other words, because Jesus Christ is God, eternally the Son of God, he is equal with the Father in every way. Equally eternal. Equally powerful. Equally glorious. He is distinct from the Father in person, but He is the same as the Father in essence. One with the Father and eternally from the Father, the only begotten Son, very God to very God. Now that's theology. And that's high theology. But it shows his greatness. Still, he didn't consider his position something to hold on to. So he took another form, a less glorious one. He took the form of a servant. Verse 7. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He emptied himself, we're told. Of what? Of what did he empty himself? Of what did he let go of? Did he pour out his deity and become a mere mortal? Or empty himself of some of his attributes? His omniscience, his omnipotence? No, that is certainly not what Paul means. That is an impossibility. God is immutable. He does not change. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He cannot deny Himself, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. So He cannot cease to be who and what He is. But He could add to what He is. And He did that by taking on human nature, by becoming both God and man. All through the Gospels, Jesus is clearly seen to be fully God. And we're studying the Gospel of John, and you'll remember not too long ago in chapter 5, verse 18, the Jewish leaders were enraged with Him because they said He was making Himself equal with God. They understood what He was saying. They understood who he believed he was and who he maintained that he was, equal with God. He didn't empty himself of his nature or deity or any of his attributes. So what did he empty? Paul doesn't actually say. Probably this is a figurative way of describing his self-humiliation. The King James Version translated emptied himself as he made himself of no reputation. And I think that's the idea. He made himself of no account, of no importance compared to others. He was like a root out of dry ground, Isaiah said. 
Paul uses the word empty in other passages in a non-literal or figurative way. For example, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 14, we have an example of that where he states that those who teach salvation is by the law make faith empty or void. In other words, the effect of their teaching is to make faith unimportant, make it insignificant, make it unnecessary, of no value. And when Christ became a man, He became like that. He is important, of course. He is the most important person who has ever existed. He is the, the focus and the center point of all of history. And what He did is the turning point of history. But his appearance was not that of being the most important person. The eternal God, the Son of God, who created all things, became himself a creature. A, a man, not a rich man, not a powerful man, not a noble man, but a servant of man. The Lord of all became servant of all. He made himself unimportant insignificant, of no value, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He became like you and me, a real man with a true body and a reasonable soul and lived body and soul perfectly by becoming obedient. And here we're told, obedient to the point of death, even Death on a cross. Now, Paul lays some stress on that. Death on a cross. I think we don't appreciate that last statement. Even death on a cross. At least not the way the Philippians would have appreciated or the Jews of that day. We appreciate the pain that was inflicted in the crucifixion with the iron nails driven into the hands and feet and the hour hours long, often days long, that it took the victim to die an excruciating death. We can appreciate that, but, but beyond that, the cross was the epitome of shame. And this is what they understood, what the Philippians would have understood, what the Jews would have understood. The Romans considered crucifixion such a, a disgrace, such a shameful death, that citizens of Rome were exempt from it. It was reserved for the worst of men. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of Man, Son of God, suffered in our place. But the real pain and the shame of the cross for Christ were not physical, but spiritual. He suffered God's full wrath, suffered hell for us in His separation from the Father. Unknown sufferings, as some theologians have described them, and I think that's accurate. We can never fully fathom what our Lord went through on the cross. That was the shame of it for the Son of God. And yet the author of Hebrews wrote that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. What joy was it that he had before him? Well, it was the joy of saving his people from the judgment that he suffered. And there's the meaning of Christmas. We generally think of the cradle this time of year. But we should never think of the cradle apart from the cross. Christ was born in Bethlehem to die at Calvary. That's why He came. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to give life by giving His own life on the cross. That was His mission. And that is love. The cross reveals who God is that He would do even that for us, that He would humble Himself to die for us and, and even die a shameful, painful death for us. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine the, the, the great distance that He came and suffered for us. There's a, 
a road I've taken a few times from Jerusalem down to the lowest place on the surface of the earth. It's a, a steady descent through the Judean desert. What makes it especially interesting is halfway down you, you pass a monument marking sea level and then continue going down until finally at 1,302 feet below sea level you enter the Jordan Valley. There to the south is the Dead Sea. It's the lowest body of water on the earth's surface where nothing lives. The valley is a wasteland. When you look back at the hills that you've traveled through, you realize how, how great the descent is from the, the breezy air of Jerusalem to the stifling climate there below in that valley, in that desert. Well, I find a faint, very faint analogy in that with the Lord's descent from heaven, the, the Jerusalem above into this spiritual wasteland below. He gave up the joy and the glories above to be a servant down here. The distance, though, is not in miles, but in the expanse between the words, the form of God and the form of a servant. That was the descent. He emptied himself to be our Savior. What that shows, Dr. Warfield said, is we have a God who is capable of self-sacrifice for us. He's not untouched by, by human sorrow. He cares. And that's a God we can love and imitate. And there is, is great blessing for doing that, imitating the incarnation. Blessing for the church with the, the, the unity that selfless service promotes. Personal blessing now in marriage and family. Paul's instruction here is the divine solution to troubled relationships which happen even in the church and in marriages that have, have grown cold. And there is eternal blessing for those who practice this. The result of Christ's humility and obedience was honor and glory. God highly exalted him, Paul wrote in verse 9, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Jesus was lifted from, from the cross and the grave to heaven and the throne. He was raised from shame to glory, to the highest station where he now is, reigning over all things. Resurrection and ascension demonstrate they are proof that his sacrifice was successful. That when he took our sins to the cross and paid for them, God accepted his payment. But Paul has a different emphasis here from that. It is exaltation as the reward for humility and service. That's what Christ received from the Father. He exalted Him, highly exalted Him. No one can be higher than Christ. Literally, He is hyper-exalted. He is super-exalted. Jesus has the highest place. He is over the heavens, and He has the highest honor. He was restored to the position and place that was His from all eternity. What He rightfully could have held on to, but left in order to serve us and obey His Father, is again His. With a difference. He brought back to heaven a human nature. He is now and forever will be both God and man in one person. And it is his, in, his humility, rather in his humanity, not his deity, in his humanity that he is exalted. His deity was veiled in flesh, but never lost or diminished. His humanity has been glorified. He is now the glorified God-man, which is the sign of what we will someday be. 
glorified human beings. All of that is the reward of his submission to the Father and his obedience and service. And as we serve him, we can expect eternal blessing as well. The Father exalted him to a place that is above every place and gave him the name which is above every name. Paul doesn't give the name, but verse 11 indicates that it is Lord. This is a way of, of saying that Jesus is God. He's God the Son. Because Lord is the equivalent to the word Jehovah or Yahweh. And so all creation will someday worship Him as that, as Lord. That's the prophecy that Paul gives in verse 10. At that name, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and those on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They will do it willingly, or they will do it reluctantly, but they will do it. They will all bow in worship to Christ. That's the future. At the end of history. In the meantime, we have the comfort of knowing our Lord rules over all things presently. He is not only the Jesus of history, He is the Lord of history. And someday He will sweep away all of the powers of this earth and all of the prevailing philosophies of the age, and He will rule forever. And we will rule with Him. That's what Jesus has obtained for everyone for whom He died. Everyone who has believed in Him, He has gained for us salvation eternal life, and everlasting glory. But again, that, re that re requires a response of love and obedience to Him. If Christ has loved His church enough to humble Himself and die for it, then we should be willing to do the same. That's certainly the lesson of the text, or at least the application of the text to our lives. But again, that is completely contrary to what people do naturally, which is put themselves first. It's what we do. We are naturally ambitious for ourselves. We seek self-glory by, by striving to reach the top, even at the expense of others. But Christ invites us to follow a different path, the one He took, path of self-sacrifice, of emptying self by becoming a servant, forgetting ourselves and putting the welfare of others first. Warfield commented on this and described what self-sacrifice means. He wrote, Where, wherever men suffer, there we will be to comfort. Wherever men strive, there we will be to help. Wherever men fail, there we will be to uplift. Wherever men succeed, there we will be to rejoice. It means, he said, forgetfulness of self in others. But then he added, it means richness of development. Self-sacrifice service is the path of the highest possible development of self. How different that is from the world we see around us. How different. It's all about self. It's all about self-love. It is a narcissistic world we live in. A self-absorbed world. I think we're all familiar with that word, narcissistic. It comes from the story about a handsome boy named Narcissus who cared for no one at all. One day he came to a, a spring of water and he bent down to drink from it. When he saw his reflection in the pool, he was amazed. He'd never seen anything so beautiful. It was love at first sight. In fact, he became so enamored of himself that he wouldn't leave the pool. He wouldn't eat or drink. He spent every day just staring at his reflection 
until he wasted away and died. The moral of the story, self-love kills. God didn't make us to be people curved in on ourselves, as Luther put it, but to look out to others. That is the path to the highest possible self-development and blessing. Warfield went on to say, we are to be binding ourselves to a thousand souls with such sympathy and love that their lives become ours. That pleases God. He blesses it. He blesses us in this life, in our, our personal life, in our, our character and our development now, and, and will certainly bless us in heaven for all eternity with glory and joy. The lesson of Christmas is very simple. It's that God gave His Son it's that Christ gave himself unto death to save us. And so the application and the implication of that is imitate Christ. Give of yourself. That's the Christian life. A selfless life that promotes present blessing and obtains future glory. Only Christ can give it. So... If you're here without Him, we invite you to come to Him. Believe in Him. He took our sins to the cross, and when He was resurrected, He left them all in the grave where they are buried and can accuse us no more. That's the promise for all who trust in Christ. If you've not done that, again, we invite you to come to Him. And if you have, rejoice in that. And then, seek to imitate Him. Well, I'm going to pray now and say the benediction. And then we're going to sing our hymn, hymn number 18 in the Songs of Praise book, In Christ Alone. And then we will move in directly to our final aspect of the service this morning and the Lord's Supper. So... Let me pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for the sending of Your Son into this world, that He would empty Himself, that He would humble Himself, taking upon Himself our human nature, taking upon Himself a physical body to become one of us in order to offer Himself up as a sacrifice for us. And so, Lord, may we be like that. May we imitate Him and sacrifice for one another. We thank You for this day and this Christmas morning. And we thank You for what we remember in it. But, Lord, every day for us should be Christmas as we reflect upon Your Son coming into this world for us. We thank You for Him, and it's in His name we pray. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 18 in the Songs of Praise book. <clears throat>